a crisis of thirst. Overview of the crisis. The episode where the Israelites faced a crisis of thirst is another instance in their wilderness journey where they grappled with physical hardship. This lack of water triggered a familiar pattern of complaints reflecting their continuous struggle with trust and faith. The Israelites' complaints. Expression of frustration. Faced with acute challenge of thirst, the Israelites voiced their frustration and discontent to Moses and Aaron. Their complaints were more than just expressions of physical discomfort. They symbolized a deeper issue of wavering faith in God's care and provision. Historical context. This incident must be understood against the backdrop of the Israelites' journey through the wilderness, a journey marked by repeated challenges and a recurring cycle of complaint and divine response. The underlying trust issue, struggle with dependence on God. The crisis of first brought to the surface the Israelites' underlying struggle with relying on God. Despite witnessing numerous miracles and acts of deliverance, they continued to question God's ability to provide for their needs. Human nature and divine expectation. This episode serves as a mirror to human nature's tendency to doubt and fear, especially in the face of uncertainty or discomfort. It also reflects the divine expectation of trust and reliance on God's promises. Reflection on the Israelites' journey. The wilderness journey, punctuated by this crisis of thirst, was as much a spiritual journey as it was physical. It was a journey marked by faith, doubt, learning, and gradual growth in understanding God's character and intentions. Each instance of complaint and divine response was an opportunity for the Israelites to learn and deepen their trust in God. The crisis of thirst was another such pivotal moment. Conclusion, the crisis as a catalyst for growth. The repeated crises, including the lack of water, served as, a, as catalysts for the Israelites' spiritual growth. They were occasions for them to experience God's provision firsthand and to learn to rely on Him. Modern day implications. For contemporary believers, this narrative offers valuable lessons about trusting in God's provision, especially during times of hardship or unmet needs. It invites reflection on personal faith journey and how challenges can be transformative in deepening faith and dependence on God. God's instruction is speak to the rock. Confronted with the Israelites' outcry for water, Moses and Aaron sought divine intervention. God's response was a specific instruction to speak to a rock. This method was chosen as a meant to rebuild God's continued care and supernatural provision for his people. Symbolism of the rock. The rock in this context was more than just a physical object. It represented a point of divine interaction where God's miraculous power could be witnessed directly by the entire community. The significance of speaking to the rock. God's command to speak to the rock was not only about providing water, it was a test of faith and obedience for Moses and Aaron. It was an opportunity for them to demonstrate their thrust in God's word and his methods. Demonstrating God's power. By merely speaking to the rock as opposed to striking it, the miraculous nature of the water provision would be unmistakably attributed to God's power not human action or natural occurrence. The intended message to the Israelites. This act was meant to reinforce to the Israelites that their sustenance and survival in the wilderness were directly dependent on God's intervention and kindness. Encouraging reliance on God. 
The intended outcome was to encourage the Israelites to continue to rely on God's provision, even in seemingly impossible situations. This was a lesson in the importance of faith and the power of God's word. The role of leadership in demonstrating faith. As leaders, Moses and Aaron were set an example of unwavering obedience to God's commands. Their actions were intended to inspire faith and trust among the people they led. A display of God's glory. The act of speaking to the rock was to be a public display of God's glory and a reinforcement of the fact that he was the ultimate, the source of all, of all their needs. Conclusion, the deeper meaning of the divine directive. God's instruction to speak to the rock had layers of meaning beyond the physical provision of water. It was about demonstrating his ongoing presence and power, testing the feet of his leaders, and teaching the community about divine reliance. Modern Reflections For contemporary believers, this narrative underscores the importance of adhering to God's instructions even when they defy conventional understanding. It invites reflection on how faith and obedience play crucial roles in experiencing God's provisions and blessings. Moses' disobedience and its consequences. Moses' defiant act. Moses, faced with the murmuring of the Israelites, acted in defiance of God's specific instruction. By striking the rock instead of speaking to it, Moses chose a path of action over divine command, leading to immediate but unauthorized provision of water. Impulsive response. This act can be seen as an impulsive response to the pressure and frustration of, lead, of leading a discontented people, reflecting a momentary lapse in Moses' usually steadfast faith and obedience. The significance of striking versus speaking. Striking the rock as opposed to the commanded act of speaking symbolize a reliance on physical action rather than the power of God's word. This act diminished the intended demonstration of God's power and sovereignty. Undermining God's authority. The act of striking instead of speaking undermined the authority and sanctity of God's word, potentially leading the people to question the necessity of strict obedience to God's commands. God's response to the disobedience. Expression of divine displeasure. God's reaction was not just to the physical act of striking the rock, but more so to the underlying lack of faith and trust this act represented. Moses and Aaron's actions were viewed as a failure to sanctify God before the Israelites. A lesson in leadership. For Moses and Aaron as leaders, this was a grave misstep. It demonstrated that even the most faithful can falter and that leaders are held to a high standard of obedience and representation of God's will. Consequences for Moses and Abraham. The most significant consequence of this disobedience was God's decision to bar Moses and Aaron from entering the promised land. This punishment underscores the seriousness with which God views the obedience and faith of his chosen leaders. A bitter outcome for a faithful servant. For Moses, what led Israel faithfully through the wilderness, this was a bitter outcome, underscoring the principle that even a lifetime of service does not exempt one from the consequences of disobedience. Theological Reflections This incident serves as a stark reminder of the cost of disobedience, even for those who have been steadfast in their faith. It highlights the importance of adhering to God's commands in both letter and spirit. A lesson for contemporary believers. For modern believers, 
Moses' experience is a cautionary tale about the importance of faithfulness, especially in positions of leadership. It teaches that actions born out of frustration or impatience can have lasting and significant consequences. Moses' punishment barred from the promised land. The gravity of leadership in faith. Moses, as the leader of the Israelites, and I and a uh, direct communicator with God was held to an exceptionally high standard of obedience and faith. His role as a leader amplified the impact of his actions, making his disobedience a matter of significant consequence. Scriptural Reflection on Leadership the principle highlighted in James chapter 3 verse 1 underscores the heightened responsibility and scrutiny placed on spiritual leaders. Those who guide others in faith are expected to exemplify strict adherence to divine commands. Moses' Final Moments Moses' journey culminated at Mount Nebo, a poignant moment where he was able to view the promised land from afar but not enter it. This moment encapsulates the tragic outcome of his disobedience. Despite being barred from entering Canaan, Moses' legacy as a leader and prophet remains unparalleled. His death marks the end of an era of direct divine intervention and guidance through the wilderness. Reflection on Moses' Leadership Journey Moses' life was marked by incredible achievements and steadfast dedication to God's people. From his early days in Egypt to leading the Israelites through the desert, his life was a testament to faithful service. The Human Aspect of Leadership Moses' banishment also highlights the human aspect of leadership. It serves as a reminder that even the most faithful and dedicated can falter under pressure and that such lapses can have profound implications. Theological Implications of Moses' Banishment Divine Justice and Mercy The banning of Moses from the Promised Land is a complex interplay of divine justice and mercy. While it demonstrates the seriousness with which God views disobedience, it also reflects the merciful nature of God who provided Moses with a glimpse of the land he had worked so tirelessly to reach. A Lesson in Humility and Obedience Moses' banishment serves as a powerful lesson in humility and the need for unwavering obedience to God's commands. It highlights the importance of faith and trust in God's plan, even in the face of immense challenges. Contemporary Lessons from Moses' Experience Leadership and Accountability For contemporary believers and leaders, Moses' experience serves as a reminder of the weight of responsibility carried by those in leadership. It emphasizes the need for humility, obedience, and a deep trust in God's guidance. Enduring faith despite consequences. Moses' unwavering faith, even after knowing he would not enter the promised land, stands as a testament to his character. It challenges believers to maintain their faith and commitment to God's will, irrespective of personal outcomes or challenges. The Symbolism of the Rock in Biblical Narratives The narrative of Moses striking the rock, as recounted in the Torah, is a profound story rich in symbolism and lessons. It highlights themes of trust, obedience, divine provision, and spiritual representation, offering a deep understanding of the relationship between God and His people. The Rock's Miraculous Provision Throughout the Israelites' wilderness journey, the motif of water flowing from a rock emerges as a significant symbol. It represents God's unceasing provision and care for His people, meeting their physical needs in a miraculous way. Symbol of God's Presence 
The rock, seemingly inert and lifeless, becomes a source of life-giving water. This transformation symbolizes how God uses ordinary elements of nature to manifest His power and presence. Christological Interpretation Rock as Christ In Christian theology, this rock is seen as a prefiguration of Christ. As stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the rock is interpreted as a metaphor for Christ, signifying his role as the spiritual sustenance and support for the believers. The consistent presence of the rock throughout the Israelites' journey allegorically represents Christ's enduring presence with his followers. It underscores the belief in Christ as a constant source of spiritual nourishment and strength. Moses' Act of Disobedience Faced with the community's outcry for water, Moses is instructed by God to speak to the rock. This command symbolizes God's desire to provide for his people through faith and obedience. Consequences for Moses Moses' choice to strike the rock instead of speaking to it represents a moment of mistrust and disobedience. This act leads to significant consequences, including his barring from entering the promised land, reflecting the importance of adhering to God's commands precisely. Conclusion The episode of Moses striking the rock serves as a key moment in biblical history, illustrating the essential themes of trust in God, obedience to His commands, and the recognition of His providential care. The allegorical interpretation of the rock as Christ enriches this narrative, offering a deeper understanding of the spiritual journey and the sustenance God provides. This story stands as a testament to the complexities of faith and the profound symbolism found within biblical narratives. Introduction The Journey to Moab Renewed Complaints and Continuous Struggles As the Israelites journeyed towards Moab, their complaints resurfaced, this time centered around a lack of food. This recurring pattern of grumbling reflects a deep-seated struggle with faith and trust in God's providence. Challenges of Faith The Israelites' journey to Moab symbolizes more than a physical trek. It represents a spiritual journey fraught with challenges and lessons in faith. Their repeated complaints highlight the difficulty of sustaining faith in the face of hardship and uncertainty. Lessons from the Wilderness The wilderness journey serves as a period of testing and growth for the Israelites. Each instance of discontent and subsequent divine response is an opportunity for them to deepen their understanding of God's character and His plans for them. God's Patience and Guidance Despite their repeated failings, God consistently shows patience and provides guidance. The journey to Moab thus becomes a testament to God's enduring commitment to His people despite their wavering faith. The Role of Leadership The leaders Moses and Aaron faced the daunting task of guiding a discontented and often rebellious people. Their leadership is continually tested as they mediate between God and the Israelites, providing both a spiritual and logistical anchor for the journey. Conclusion The Israelites' journey to Moab is emblematic of the spiritual trials and tribulations that characterize the human relationship with the divine. Their repeated complaints and God's responses illuminate the complexities of faith the challenges of spiritual leadership, and the unyielding patience and guidance of God. This part of the Israelites' journey serves as a profound lesson in trust and reliance on God, offering timeless insights 
into the journey of faith. The bronze serpent, a symbol of salvation, divine retribution and its implications, the arrival of serpents among the Israelites, leading to numerous fatalities was a direct consequence of their continuous complaints and ingratitude. This event serves as a stark reminder of the zipir repercussions that can follow disobedience and lack of faith in God. Symbolism of the serpents. The serpents not only represent divine retribution, but also symbolize the sin and rebellion of the Israelites. Their presence is a physical manifestation of the spiritual corruption that had permitted the community. The healing power of the bronze serpent. Even in punishment, God's mercy is evident. Upon the Israelites' repentance, God provided a means of healing through the bronze serpent. This act highlights God's readiness to forgive and heal even after enacting judgment. Bronze serpent as a symbol of faith. The bronze serpent on a pole becomes a powerful symbol of salvation. Those who looked upon it in faith were healed, illustrating the principle that salvation and healing often require an act of faith and trust in God's provisions. Christological interpretation. In Christ theology, the bronze serpent is seen as a foreshadowing of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Just as the Israelites were healed by looking at the bronze serpent, Christians believe that salvation comes through faith in Christ. Transformation of a symbol of death into one of life. The serpent, typically a symbol of sin and death, is transformed into an instrument of healing and life. This transformation prefigures how Christ, through his death, conquers sin and death, offering eternal life. Conclusion, Lessons from the Bronze Serpent The story of the Bronze Serpent stands as a profound lesson in the dynamics of divine judgment and mercy. It teaches that God's disciplinary actions are often tempered with opportunities for redemption and healing. The bronze serpent, as a symbol of salvation, invites reflection on the power of faith and the transformative grace that can emerge even from moments of great trial and suffering. This narrative serves as a vivid reminder of the need for repentance, faith, and reliance on divine provision and the journey of life. Defeating Sihon and Og The Israelites' journey to the Promised Land involved strategic territorial negotiations. Their peaceful request to pass through the land of the Amorites, ruled by King Sihon of Hashbon, was met with hostility, escalating into a military conflict. Divine intervention and victory in this confrontation, the Israelites experienced di direct divine intervention. God enabled their victory over Sihon, demonstrating his power and commitment to fulfilling his promises. This victory was more than a military success. It was a tangible manifestation of God's support and guidance. The encounter with Og of Bashan, challenge and triumph. The encounter with Og, king of Bashan, followed a similar pattern. Despite facing formidable opposition, the Israelites, aided by divine assistance, were able to defeat Og and his forces. Acquisition of Land These victories were significant not just for the immediate military implications, but also for their long-term impact on the Israelites' journey. The defeat of Sihon and Og led to the acquisition of new territories, furthering the Israelites' progress toward establishing themselves in the Promised Land. Theological Implications These events underscore God's role as a warrior in behalf of His people. 
The victories over Sihon and Og reinforce the understanding of God as a protector and provider, actively involved in the historical and physical realities of his people. Faith in God's Promises the successful conquest served to bolster the Israelites' faith in God's promises. Witnessing God's hand in these victories would have strengthened their confidence in His ability to lead them into and secure the promised land. Conclusion Significance of the Victories The defeats of Sihon and Og are pivotal moments in the narrative of the Israelites' journey to the promised land. They highlight the active presence of God in the lives of His people, providing for their needs and ensuring their success against formidable force. These events are emblematic of the broader theme of trust in divine providence and the fulfillment of God's promises. For the Israelites and in the broader biblical narrative, these victories underscored the notion that with God's support, even seemingly insurmountable challenges could be overcome. Prophecy on the Plains of Moab, King Balak and Balaam King Balak's Concern Threat Perception King Balak of Sipor, witnessing the conquest of the Israelites, perceived them as a formidable threat. His fear of their growing power drove him to seek unconventional means to counteract their influence. Seeking divine intervention. In his attempt to weaken Israel, Balak turned to spiritual tactics. He sought the services of Balaam, a renowned seer, hoping to use divine curses as a weapon against the Israelites. The Seer's Conflict Balaam, caught between a king's request and divine will, faced a moral and spiritual dilemma. His role as a seer was tested in a phase of pressure from Balak and guidance from God. Blessings instead of curses. In a twist of faith, Balaam, moved by divine instruction, blessed the Israelites, contradicting Balak's intentions. These blessings emphasized the inviolability of God's favor toward Israel. Prophetic Oracles Affirmation of God's Kingship Balaam's oracles went beyond mere blessings. They included a powerful affirmation of God's sovereignty over Israel. This acknowledgement reinforced the idea of a theocratic kingship where God himself is seen as the ultimate ruler of his people. A prophetic glimpse of the Messiah. Among the blessings, Balaam prophesied the rise of a ruler from Israel, a reference that has been interpreted in Christian theology as a foreshadowing of Christ. This prophecy points to a future where a significant figure would emerge from Israel to lead and see. Theological Implications Divine will over human schemes. The narrative of Balak and Balaam highlights a crucial biblical theme, the supremacy of divine will over human plans. Despite Balak's intentions, God's purposes prevailed, turning intended curses into blessings. Prophetic insight into salvation history. Balaam's blessings and prophecies are seen as significant insights into God's plan for salvation history. They underscore the concept of a chosen people and a promised Savior, weaving the story of Israel into the larger tapestry of divine redemption. Conclusion The Legacy of Balaam's Prophecy The encounter between King Balak, Balaam, and the Israelites on the plains of Moab presents a rich narrative of fear, divine intervention, and prophecy. It serves as a reminder of God's protective hand over his people and his ability to transform adversarial intentions into blessings. Moreover, 
Balaam's prophecies offer a profound look into the future, connecting the ancient story of Israel with a broader Christian understanding of messianic fulfillment and divine sovereignty. Israel Sin, the worship of Baal of Peor. The episode of Israel Sin with the worship of Baal of Peor, as described in the biblical book of Numbers, chapter 25, is a significant event in the narrative of the Israelites' journey to the Promised Land. It represents a clear instance of both moral failure and religious infidelity among the Israelites. Let's delve deeper into the various aspects of this event. Context and setting. The Israelites were camped as Shittim in the plains of Moab. This location was significant as it was near the end of their 40 year journey through the wilderness. Here, they were on the threshold of entering the promised land, which adds a poignant aspect to their lapse into sin. Indulgence and idolatry. The Israelites began to engage in sexual immorality with Moabite women. This was not a merely failure in terms of sexual ethics, but also had significant religious implications. The involvement with Moabite women led the Israelites to participate in the worship of their gods, particularly Baal of Peor. Baal worship was characterized by fertility rites and possibly temple prostitution, which were antithetical to the worship of Yahweh. Baal of Peor Baal was a common name for gods in the region with pure, likely a specific location or aspect of Baal worship. This deity was associated with fertility and agricultural abundance, which might have been appealing to a people about to settle in a new land. Theological Implications From a theological standpoint, this incident was a great breach of the covenant relationship between Israel and Yahweh. The first two commandments, which prohibit other gods and idolatry, were directly violated. This event thus represented a turning away from Yahweh, not just in action, but in heart and allegiance. Divine Response and Consequences The episode resulted in divine wrath, leading to a plague among the Israelites. The seriousness of the sin was underscored by the severe punishment that followed, which included the execution of the ringleaders and a plague that killed 24,000 people. Moral and Spiritual Lessons This story serves as a warning against the seductions of foreign influences and the ease with which one can be led astray from faith and morality. It's a cautionary tale about the consequences of syncretism, blending or combining different religious beliefs, and the importance of remaining faithful to one's covenant commitments. Exegetical Perspectives In the context of Catholic teaching, this story can be interpreted as a reminder of the dangers of idolatry in all its forms, including the modern-day idols of materialism, power, and pleasure. It also underscores the need for repentance and fidelity to God's laws. In summary, the incident of Baal of Peor in the biblical narrative is a complex event that intertwines moral, religious, and theological themes. It serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of turning away from God and the importance of maintaining fidelity to the covenant. The Incident of Cult Prostitution The incident of cult prostitution involving an Israelite man and a Moabite woman, as detailed in the biblical account in Numbers 25, is a dramatic and complex event. This episode is often interpreted in light of themes of covenant fidelity, divine justice, and zealous leadership. Let's explore this incident in detail. Public Defiance 
The core of the incident is an Israelite man, later identified as Zimri, son of Salu, who brought a Midianite woman, Cosby, daughter of Zur, into his community. Directly in the sight of Moses and the assembly of Israel. This act was not only sexually immoral, but was a public defiance of God's commandments, especially given the context of Israel's covenant relationship with God. It represented a flagrant disregard for the religious and moral laws that were central to Israel's identity and existence. Quote prostitution context. The woman involved was from Bijan a region associated with the Moabites and their religious practices, including the worship of Baal the Peor. The act can be understood within the broader context of cult prostitution, which was a common practice in Canaanite fertility cults and involved ritualistic sexual acts as a form of worship. Phineas Zealous Act Phineas, the grandson of Aaron the high priest, witnessed this act and responded with a zealous and violent intervention. He took a spear and killed both Simri and Cosby in their tent. This drastic action was a direct, direct and immediate this, da, this drastic action was a direct and immediate response to what he perceived as a gross violation of the covenant and an affront to the holiness of God. Divine Response Phineas' act was met with divine approval. God's wrath, which had manifested in a plague as punishment for the Israelites' idolatry and immorality, was halted due to Phineas' intervention. This incident highlights the concept of divine justice in the Old Testament where immediate and direct actions are often seen as a response to sin and disobedience. From a theological standpoint, this episode underscores the gravity of idolatry and immorality in the eyes of God, especially when these sins are committed openly and defiantly. It also demonstrates the importance of zealous leadership in upholding God's law and the sanctity of the covenant community. In Catholic theology, this story is understood as an example of God's righteousness and the serious consequences of sin, particularly sins that involve a rejection of God's commandments. However, the violent action of Phineas is not typically presented as a model for personal behavior, but rather as an illustration of the seriousness with which God viewed the covenant relationship. In contemporary readings, this incident raises complex questions about religious zeal, the use of violence in defense of faith, and the nature of divine justice. It's often seen as a call to fidelity and obedience to God's laws while also cautioning against the dangers of extremism in religious practice. In summary, the incident of cult prostitution in Numbers 25 is a multifaceted event that serves as a profound reflection on the themes of covenant fidelity, divine justice, and the role of leadership in upholding religious and moral, moral standards. It highlights the severe consequences of idolatry and immorality, especially when committed in open defiance of God's law and the importance of zealous commitment to upholding the sanctity of the covenant community. Phineas reward covenant of peace. The covenant of peace granted to Phineas, as recorded in Numbers chapter 25, verses 10 to 13, is a significant moment in the biblical narrative, particularly in the context of the Israelites' journey to Moab and their relationship with God. This reward to Phineas reflects several key themes in biblical theology, including divine justice, 
priesthood and the nature of covenant. Let's delve deeper into this aspect. Divine Commendation Phineas' act of zeal in killing the Israelite man and Midianite woman was seen as a turning point in the Israelites' descent into idolatry and immorality. God's response to Phineas was not merely approval, but a significant commendation in the form of a covenant of peace. This covenant was a divine acknowledgement of Phineas' role in upholding God's law and the sanctity of the Israelite community. Covenant of Peace The term covenant of peace is rich in meaning. In the context of the surrounding violence and the wrath of God displayed through the plague, this covenant can be seen as a restoration of harmony between God and the Israelites. It was a sign of God's willingness to reconcile with his people despite their transgressions. Everlasting Priesthood The promise of an everlasting priesthood to Phineas and his descendants was significant. In the Old Testament, the priesthood was a role of mediation between God and the people of Israel. Priests performed sacrifices and rituals to atone for the sins of the people and to maintain the sanctity of the relationship between God and Israel. By granting this everlasting priesthood to Phineas, God was not only rewarding Phineas, but also ensuring the continual process of atonement and mediation for Israel. Atoning for Israel's Sins Phineas' action was seen as atoning for the sins of the Israelites. His zeal effectively halted the plague, signifying a turning away of God's wrath. This aspect of atonement is central to the understanding of the priesthood in the Old Testament, where the priest acts as an intermediary to restore the people's relationship with God. In the broader narrative of the Israelites' journey, this event is a crucial moment. It comes after various challenges to their faith, including encounters with divine judgment, military victories, and the seduction into idolatry of Peor. The action of Phineas and his subsequent reward highlight the importance of fidelity to God and the consequences, both positive and negative, of the Israelites' actions. From a theological perspective, this incident and the covenant of peace with Phineas underscore the seriousness with which God views the covenant relationship with his people. It also illustrates the concept of divine justice and mercy, justice in the immediate punishment of sin, and mercy in the restoration and promise of peace. In contemporary theological reflection, particularly with Catholicism, this story can be seen as an example of God's desire for reconciliation and peace with his people. The priesthood, while different in the new covenant established by Christ, continues to have the role of mediation and atonement, highlighting the ongoing need for reconciliation between humanity and God. In conclusion, Phineas reward of a covenant peace and the promise of an everlasting priesthood is a profound moment in the Israelites' journey, reflecting the themes of divine justice, mercy, and the continuous role of the priesthood in mediating the relationship between God and his people. This episode, among others, in the Israelites' journey to Moab illustrates their complex and often challenging relationship with God marked by struggles of faith, divine judgment, and the ongoing process of reconciliation and atonement. Preparing to enter the Promised Land The request made by the tribes of Reuben and God for land east of the Jordan River, as described in the book of Numbers, chapters 32, is a significant episode in the narrative of the Israelites' journey to the Promised Land. This story encompasses themes of leadership, responsibility, and community commitment. Let's explore this in more detail. Request for Land As the Israelites approached the Promised Land, the tribes of Reuben and God, who had large herds and flocks, 
found the lands of Jazer and Gilead east of the Jordan River to be very suitable for livestock. They approached Moses, Eleazar, the priest, and the leaders of the community to request these lands as their permanent inheritance instead of land on the west side of the Jordan. This request was significant as it deviated from the original plan of settling all tribes within the borders of the promised land as defined by God. Moses initially responded with concern and hesitation. His primary worry was that this request could demoralize the other Israelites and dissuade them from crossing the Jordan to conquer the land as commanded by God. Moses feared that it would be reminiscent of the incident with the spies where the Israelites lost faith and were consequently condemned to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses saw this as potentially tempting the Lord and leading to further delay or punishment. Compromise and Agreement in response to Moses' concerns, the tribes of Reuben and God proposed a compromise. They agreed to build fortified settlements for their families and livestock in Jazer and Gilead, but committed their fighting men to join the rest of the Israelites in the conquest of the land west of the Jordan. They promised not to return to their homes until every Israelite tribe had received its inheritance. This showed their commitment to the community and their willingness to fulfill their obligations to the nation of Israel before attending to their own interest. Moses accepted this proposal under certain conditions. He stipulated that if the men of Reuben and God fulfilled their commitment to fight alongside their fellow Israelites, then the lands of Jazer and Gilead would be theirs. However, if they failed to honor this agreement, they would receive no inheritance and would have to settle in the land assigned by Moses west of the Jordan. Theological and Ethical Insights This episode offers several insights. It demonstrates the importance of community responsibility and the need to balance personal desires with the greater good of the community. It also shows the value of negotiation and compromise in resolving disputes. From a leadership perspective, Moses' approach highlights the importance of addressing potential issues head-on while leading to practical solutions. The agreement also had a covenantal aspect. The tribes of Reuben and God were held to their word, reflecting the broader theme of the covenant between God and Israel where obedience and commitment were expected in return for God's blessings and provisions. Final instructions before entering Canaan. The final instructions given to the Israelites before entering Canaan, as recounted in the Hebrew Bible, particularly in the book of Numbers, are profound both in their immediate historical context and their symbolic representation of the spiritual journey. The 42 stages of the Israelites' journey from Egypt to Canaan are indeed emblematic of a spiritual pilgrimage towards a divine destination. Let's explore this in more detail. The journey of the Israelites from Egypt to the borders of Canaan is marked by 42 distinct stages as listed in Numbers 33. These stages represent the physical journey of a nation from slavery to the brink of entering the promised land. Each stage with its unique challenges and experiences contributed to the shaping of the Israelite identity and faith. Spiritual journey. The physical journey of the Israelites is often interpreted as an allegory for the spiritual journey of the soul. Just as the Israelites moved from the bandage of Egypt representing sin or spiritual slavery towards the promised land, symbolizing communion with God, the soul is seen as journeying from a state of separation from God towards unity and fellowship with Him. 
challenges and lessons learned. The journey through the wilderness was not straightforward. It involved various challenges, including encounters with hostile nations, internal rebellions, moments of faithlessness, and direct confrontations with God's commandments. Each of these episodes can be seen as reflective of the trials and tribulations faced by the soul in its spiritual journey, offering lessons of faith, obedience, perseverance, and reliance on God. Final Instructions as the Israelites prepared to enter Canaan, they received final instructions that were crucial for their life in the new land. These instructions included laws, commandments, and guidelines for living in accordance with God's will. Similarly, in the spiritual journey, there are moral and ethical teachings, doctrines, and spiritual disciplines that guide the soul towards its ultimate destination. The transition from the wilderness to Canaan was a significant transformation for the Israelites. It's, it marked the end of one phase of their existence and the beginning of another. This can be likened to the transformative process in the spiritual journey where there is a continual progression from one state to a higher state of understanding, closeness, and conformity to God. In the spiritual allegory, Canaan represents more than just a physical territory. It symbolizes the fulfillment of God's promises, a state of peace, prosperity, and spiritual fulfillment. It is akin to the soul attaining its ultimate destination in the presence and communion with God. While the entry into Canaan marked the end of the physical journey, it was not the end of the Israelites' spiritual journey. They continued to face challenges, make choices, and learn to live as a community faithful to God. This mirrors the understanding that the spiritual journey is ongoing, with the ultimate union with God being a continuous process often understood in Christian theology as sanctification. In conclusion, the final instructions to the Israelites and the 42 stages of their journey from Egypt to Canaan can be deeply instructive for understanding the spiritual journey of the soul. This journey is marked by challenges learning, transformation, and the eventual fulfillment of being in communion with God. The narrative serves as an allegory for the soul's journey towards its divine destination, emphasizing faith, obedience, and continual growth in spiritual life. Territorial Boundaries and Allocation the territorial boundaries and allocation of land to the Israelite tribes, as detailed in chapter 34 of the Book of Numbers, is a key element in the narrative of the Israelites' settlement in Canaan. This division of land not only had immediate practical implications, but also carried significant theological and symbolic meanings. Let's delve deeper into these aspects. In chapter 34 of Numbers, God provides Moses with the specific instructions regarding the boundaries of the land of Canaan, which was to be allocated to the Israelite tribes. These boundaries delineate the territory from the wilderness in the south to the mountains of Lebanon in the north, and from the river Jordan in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The land was to be divided among the tribes by lot, which was a common biblical method for making decisions believed to be guided by God's providence. The allocation of land to each tribe was not just a practical matter of settling people in a new territory. It was a fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give their descendants the land of Canaan. This division symbolized God's faithfulness and the establishment of Israel as a nation and the land promised to their ancestors. Prior to the general allocation of Canaan, 
the tribes of Reuben and God, along with the half-tribe of Manasseh, requested and were granted land east of the Jordan River in the regions of Jasser and Gilead. This area was suitable for their large flocks and herds. Their settlement here was conditional upon their commitment to assist the other tribes in conquering the land west of the Jordan, a commitment they fulfilled. The detailed boundaries for each tribe ensured a fair and equitable distribution of the land. This was important for the social and economic stability of the nation. The boundaries were meant to establish a sense of order and identity for each tribe within the larger community of Israel. Theologically, the division of the land is seen as a tangible expression of the covenant relationship between God and Israel. It was a demonstration of God's sovereignty and providence. The land itself was considered a gift from God, and its allocation was an act of divine grace. The allocation of land to each tribe had symbolic significance as well. It represented the transition from a nomadic lifestyle to a settled existence. This transition was crucial for the development of Israel's national, religious, and cultural identity. The actual possessions and settlement of the land were not without challenge. It involved military campaigns and the displacement of existing populations, raising complex questions about justice, warfare, and the fulfillment of divine promises. These issues have resonated throughout biblical history and have had lasting impacts on the theological and ethical discussions in Judaism and Christianity. In summary, the territorial boundaries and allocation of land as described in the book of Numbers are crucial in understanding the fulfillment of divine promises to the Israelites. It signifies a pivotal moment in the establishment of Israel as a nation under God's covenant, with the land serving as a physical and symbolic representation of this covenant relationship. The division of land also laid the foundation for the social, economic, and religious life of the Israelite tribes in their new homeland. Provision for the Levites The provision for the Levites in the biblical narrative is outlined in the book of Numbers and Joshua is a significant aspect of the Israelites' societal and religious structure. The Levites, who were set apart for religious duties, were not allotted a specific territory like the other tribes. Instead, they were given cities and surrounding lands within the territories of the other tribes. This arrangement reflects the unique role of the Levites in Israelite society and their dependence on the broader community. Let's expand on this. The Levites were descendants of Levi, one of the twelve sons of Jacob. They were set apart for religious service, particularly for the work related to the tabernacle and later the temple. Because their primary vocation was religious service, they did not engage in typical economic activities like farming and herding on a large scale. To support them, 48 cities were allocated to the Levites across the various tribal territories. These cities provided them with a place to live and lands around the cities for their flocks and herds. This arrangement ensured that the Levites were integrated into the wider Israelite society and supported by the other tribes. Unlike the other tribes, the Levites did not receive a large contiguous portion of land as an inheritance. This lack of territorial inheritance was offset by their spe special role in the religious and spiritual life of the community. In lieu of land, they were supported by the fights and offerings given by the rest of the Israelites. Cities of Refuge 
Among the 48 cities assigned to the Levites, six were designated as cities of refuge. These cities served a unique legal and social function. They provided asylum for individuals who had committed manslaughter, offering a place of refuge until a fair trial could be conducted. The purpose of these cities was to prevent the blood vengeance that was common in ancient societies. It allowed for a cooling off period and ensured that justice was served in a measured and fair manner. The provisions for the Levites and the establishment of cities of refuge had deep theological and social implications. For the Levites, it underscored their role as mediators between God and the people, focusing on spiritual and religious duties rather than economic pursuits. The cities of refuge highlighted the value of justice and mercy in the Israelite legal system. They were a practical application of the biblical principle of the sanctity of life and the importance of just and fair legal processes. Integration and support. The distribution of Levitical cities across the territories of other tribes ensured the integration of the Levites into the wider community. It facilitated the Levites' religious duties across the nation and reinforced the idea that they were a part of and supported by the entire nation of Israel. The Levites and their cities, especially the cities of refuge, can be seen as symbolic of God's provision and protection. They represent the idea that society should uphold values of justice, mercy, and communal responsibility. In summary, the provision for the Levites in the form of cities and the special designation of cities of refuge represent important aspects of the Israelites' religious, social, and legal systems. These provisions reflect the Levites' unique role in society, the importance of justice and mercy in legal matters, and the integration and mutual support within the diverse tribes of Israel. Half tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, inheritance of Selophehad's daughters. Background of the issue. The inheritance of Selophehad's daughters is a notable event in the biblical narrative, specifically in the context of the half tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. Selophehad, a member of the tribe of Manasseh, died without having any sons. In a patriarchal society, when inheritance typically passed through male heirs, this situation raised a significant legal and social question. The Dothers request, Selophehad's Dothers, Mala, Noah, Hogla, Malka, and Thirza, approach Moses and the leaders of Israel with a petition. They argued that their father's name and inheritance in the land should not disappear just because he had no sons. They requested the right to inherit their father's property. Moses brought their case before God, who affirmed the daughter's position. The Lord instructed Moses that the daughters of Selophehad were indeed entitled to inherit their father's land. This ruling was groundbreaking as it modified the existing inheritance laws, allowing daughters to inherit if a man died without male heirs. This ruling, however, raised another concern regarding the preservation of tribal land boundaries. If a daughter who inherited land married a man from a different tribe, it could lead to the transfer of land ownership from one tribe to another, thus diluting the tribal land holdings. To address this issue, a further ruling was made. Women who inherited land were required to marry within their own tribe. The stipulation ensured that land inheritance stayed within the tribe, preserving the tribal boundaries and allocations as designated during the conquest and settlement of Canaan. Cultural and social significance. 
The case of Selefihad's daughters is significant for several reasons. It highlights the evolution of legal thought in ancient Israel, particularly in terms of women's rights and inheritance laws. The resolution shows a balance between upholding the rights of individual families while maintaining the collective tribal identity and integrity. From a theological perspective, the story reflects God's concern for justice and equity. It shows that the laws were adaptable and could be revised to address new circumstances, ensuring fairness and the well-being of all members of the community. The story of Selefihad's daughters set a precedent in Israelite law and has been influential in discussions about gender, inheritance, and legal rights. It is often cited as an example of progressive revelation in the Hebrew scriptures where societal norms are challenged and reformed under divine guidance. In conclusion, the inheritance of Selefihad's daughters represents a significant moment in the legal and social history of the Israelites. It reflects the dynamic nature of law in response to societal needs and the ongoing quest for a balance between individual rights and communal responsibilities. Deuteronomy, Moses, Farewell, and the Second Law Introduction to Deuteronomy the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Hebrew Bible, is essentially a collection of Moses' final speeches to the Israelites. It serves as a recapitulation of the laws given throughout the Exodus journey and a reinforcement of the covenant between God and His people. This book is often referred to as the second law because it reiterates and expands upon the law given at Sinai. Moses' Final Speeches As the Israelites prepared to enter the Promised Land, Moses, aware that he would not enter the land with them, delivered a series of speeches. These speeches were meant to remind the Israelites of their history, the laws they were to live by, and the covenantal relationship they had with God. Moses emphasized the importance of obedience to God's commandments as the key to prosperity and success in the new land. In chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, Moses provided guidelines for the appointment and conduct of a king, a role that would later become central in the Israelite nation. These guidelines were revolutionary for their time emphasizing that the king was not to be a figure of absolute power and wealth. Instead, the king was instructed to avoid accumulating excessive wealth, horses, or wives, and to not lead the people back to Egypt, symbolically or literally. The king was also commanded to write for himself a copy of the law, to read it all his life, and to learn to fear the Lord his God. The Shema and Monotheism one of the most significant theological state statements in Deuteronomy and the entire Hebrew Bible is found in the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This verse asserts the fundamental principle of monotheism, the belief in one God. The Shema becomes a central declaration of faith in Judaism and is recited in daily prayers. It underscores the importance of loyalty to one God and the need to teach these laws diligently to future generations, ensuring the continuity of faith and covenantal identity. Conclusion, Legacy of Moses' Teachings Deuteronomy, with its compilation of Moses' final speeches and laws, represents a pivotal moment in the religious and communal life of Israel. It serves as a bridge between the nomadic life in the wilderness and the settled life in the Promised Land. The teachings of Moses in Deuteronomy have had a lasting impact on Jewish law, theology, and identity, emphasizing the themes of covenant, obedience, and monotheism. 
The book concludes with the death of Moses, marking the end of an era and the transition to a new leadership under Joshua. The death of Moses, Moses' final moments on Mount Nebo. In chapter 34 of the book of Deuteronomy, the narrative reaches a poignant moment as Moses, the leader of the Israelites, approaches the end of his life. God commands Moses to ascend Mount Nebo, a peak in the Abarim range in the land of Moab, which overlooks the Jordan Valley and the Promised Land. From this vantage point, Moses is granted a view on the entire land of Canaan, the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he is told that he will not enter it. This moment is both triumphant and tragic. Triumphant in that Moses sees the fulfillment of God's promises to his ancestors, but tragic as he himself will not enter the land. The significance of the view from Mount Nebo. The view from Mount Nebo symbolizes the completion of Moses' mission of leading the Israelites out of Egypt and to the borders of the Promised Land. It also represents the fulfillment of God's promise to the patriarchs. This moment serves as a powerful reminder of the faithfulness of God, even as it underscores the consequences of disobedience. Moses was denied entry into the land due to his disobedience at Meribah Kadesh. Moses' death marks the end of an era of direct divine guidance through this iconic prophet and leader. He is described as unparalleled in all of Israel, a prophet who knew the Lord face to face. Moses' legacy is profound. He is remembered as the lawgiver, the leader who brought the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, and the man who mediated the covenant between God and his people. His teachings, actions, and leadership style continue to be a source of inspiration and guidance for countless generations. The burial of Moses adds an element of mystery to his story. According to the biblical account, Moses dies at the age of 120 in the land of Moab and is buried in an unknown location. His burial site was not disclosed to anyone, and to this day, the location remains one of the great mysteries of the biblical narrative. This secrecy might have been intended to prevent his grave from becoming a shrine, focusing instead on his life and legacy. Conclusion Transition to a new phase of Israelite history The death of Moses signifies a critical transition in the narrative of the Israelites. It marks the end of the wilderness wanderings and the beginning of a new phase of history, the settlement in the Promised Land. Moses' death also sets the stage for new leadership under Joshua, who would lead the people into Canaan. This transition highlights the continuity of God's plan for Israel, even as leadership passes from one individual to another. Thank you for joining us in this enlightening journey through the life and legacy of Moses. In this episode, we explored Moses' pivotal role in leading the Israelites through their crisis of thirst, highlighting the deeper spiritual struggles they face. We delve into the powerful symbolism of speaking to the rock, emphasizing the importance of faith and obedience. We also reflected on Moses' disobedience and its consequences, illustrating profound lessons in leadership and divine justice. As we continue our exploration, we invite you to join us for the next episode, The Conquest from Promise to Possession. We'll delve into the strategic and spiritual significance of Canaan, examining the cultural dynamics and military fortifications that shaped this ancient land. We will also uncover the spiritual battles and the divine intervention that marked the Israelite journey into the promised land. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you won't miss any future episodes. If you found this content valuable, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others who might benefit from this insight. Thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. 
ガイドだよ。